up uh, in, in Sheep's Head Day, Brooklyn. Somehow or other in those days, we used to like to do things like try to repair bicycles and uh, try, try to create things. After school, I would go out and find televisions on the street. I would pick them up. I would try to fix them. But everything was self-taught. I never went to school to learn any kind of electronics. My parents used to uh, take me to the uh, upstate hotels and in those areas they allow pinball machines since pinball machines were illegal in New York City and the object of the game was to win a free game and what some people did was accumulate free games and sell them to somebody else so it was considered a way in a gambling device and that's why they weren't permitted in New York City and some other states. So I used to stand in the pinball room all day when there was a broken machine waiting for the uh, pinball mechanic to come to repair it. He used to yell at me, get your head out of the machine because he was afraid that I would get hurt by something. But he saw that I had an interest in it and he would uh, give me free games before, uh, before he left. This Bally Bow and Arrow is a little something special for me. In the days that pinball machines were illegal in New York City, there was this uh, card playing joint in Brooklyn, and it was downstairs, and there was mainly older guys uh, playing cards for money, so it was an illegal gambling uh, joint. But inside, there was a Bally Bow and Arrow pinball machine. I found out about the place because I used to repair television sets when I was a teenager. I went down to get the money, I saw the Bally Bow and Arrow pinball machine. From then on, they let me in to play it in the evenings, and this was the first pinball machine I was able to play in New York City. I was intrigued with the uh, complexity of uh, the way a pinball machine operated, with all the machinery and all the switches and all the moving parts, and a jukebox was similar that way. This was the first jukebox I was able to acquire. My dad, he was an auto parts salesman and used to go to uh, different gas stations and auto parts stores. One day he saw this in the corner of a gas station. He called me and says, this guy is, has this Rockola jukebox. And I brought it home, analyzed it, and got it to work. My first jukebox repair. This is my uh, sentimental jukebox. Uh, I intend to have this one the rest of my life. And here's another one of mine. This is quite an unusual futuristic design. Um, it was designed after the Russian uh, satellite Sputnik. Looks just like it. This is a Scopitone machine. It's kind of a predecessor of uh, MTV music videos. These were found in uh, high-end clubs and hotels in the uh, early to mid-60s, and it contains um, 36 16-millimeter sound films of musicals, and it works just like a jukebox. The people that have jukeboxes usually have songs from when they were growing up. And when they play particular records, they, they remember who they were dating, where they were. It brings back memories of, of different stages of life to them. The machine could have been sitting uh, in the basement for uh, 20 or 30 years, and they don't want to see it on the curb going into a garbage truck. And it's unbelievable, you know, the joy in, 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 in their face when they get this machine back working that they haven't seen working for so many years and here it is bringing back memories of, uh, of 20 or 30 years ago. It's a real rewarding feeling to be able to uh, preserve the history of these old machines that were manufactured many years ago and in a way I feel when I'm leaving a machine working that I'm leaving things better than the way I found them.